Welcome to It's Your Date with Destiny with Apostle Vivian and Pastor Gemma Duncan of Divine Destiny Worship Center in Diego Martin. For the next 30 minutes, join us as we take you on a journey of maximizing your potential and realizing your goals through Jesus Christ. Why is it when you need a miracle, it doesn't happen, but when you least expect it, it happens? You are married. You have challenges in your relationship, but your spouse is unwilling to accede to any counseling. Is divorce an option? I'm no How does a parent handle a promiscuous child? A what are considered the do's and don'ts of a born-again so couple who is not yet married? There are always more questions than answers. That so here is Apostle Gemma. Mm. A very good morning to you. As usual, I'm very excited to be here with you today. And uh, I have some really interesting things to talk about. But before I do, in the event that you are a first time viewer, my name is Gemma Duncan. I am from Divine Destiny Worship Center where I pastor alongside my husband, Apostle Vivian Duncan. Our headquarters is in Digo Martin, Trinidad. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about child rearing. I know that um, there probably is not any one or right way to do things, um, but somebody asked a question that triggered off some responses from me, and I thought that I'd probably stick with that today. And a question was asked. Somebody told me that my children have no training what did they really mean? <laughs> in most cases, when we say that a child is well-trained, and I want to go on the positive side today, um, we're not going to go on the negative. When we say that a child is well-trained, and if sometimes somebody will compliment a parent and say, wow, your child is well-trained, you know, they, they refer to things like good manners. Usually, those are some of the things that people talk about. So when our child is mannerly or has ex good manners, we see that the child is well trained. And I'll talk about that a little more. We're talking about courtesies, when that child knows uh, you know, all the little ins and outs of what is good courtesy, then we see the child is well mannered. Um, we also deal with etiquette. So you say somebody has good manners when they display good etiquette and it goes across the, the board in terms of etiquette, table manners and all those things go with it. And generally, good behavior. <laughs> so usually when a child generally exhibits good behavior, we say that the child is well trained. So <laughs> I don't know which one of these that that person was referring to and hopefully it's not all of them. You know, because sometimes it could be just one incident that a child displays and the person says the child has no training. No, it's not fair to a parent because children do all kinds of stuff. And they surprise us at times with the way they behave because how they behave sometimes is not how they were trained. So I'm not going to be too hard on that parent because I really don't know the circumstances. Now I'll tell you if somebody who knows the child very well over a period of time, like a teacher and you know, um, or somebody, a family member who has observed that child over a period of time says something like that to you, then I would want to consider all of those four things. Let's go to good manners. And um, this is my little humble opinion that we lack good manners today, not just among children, but just big people. You know, a long ago, they forced us to be manly, you, you know. They punished you if you were not manly. And we're talking about simple things like saying good morning. And uh, I've observed that, uh, you know, you come upon an adult and the child says hi. Or um, that person is employed and your senior manager is there and you enter the room and you say hi. I have seen people come as, to us as pastors and they come to the office and they say hi. No, in my little humble opinion, I don't think that's good manners. You're supposed to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening or whatever the case may be, you know. Um, hi 
it is something that you use more with your friends, you know, um, your little pollywals, and you're hanging out there with them, your BFFs, and so on, you say hi, you know, and um, you see, uh, we are Caribbean people, and sometimes we embrace the cultures of foreigners. So you look on TV and they say hi, and so we say hi, <laughs> you know, and so, but before, when I was younger, that was a long time ago, you did not dare say hi to an adult. Absolutely not. If you did, um, you would have what we now call dentures, and our day they used to call it pleat. <laughs> it doesn't matter who the adult was. It, the, the person didn't have to be a relative, a family member. It could be a, a, somebody from the village. They would straighten you out, and you know, you probably would have to have, go to the dentist, and so on. We were that extreme. And that's the truth, right? Um, thank you. And they would, I have seen, in my case, they would withhold something from you as a small child until you say, Thank you. Now, you are there very puzzled. I used to be because why they, why is, if my mommy is giving me something and I am taking it and she's holding on to it tight and there's a little tug of war going on between you and the adult with this particular thing that they're handing to you until it dawns on you, they're trying to get you to say something. And then you're, in your little brain, you say, oh, thank you. And they say, oh, good, thank you. you know, or no thanks, you know. Um, you could not say no. Do you want some juice? No. And you see that all the time. You're supposed to say no thanks. I mean, you can say no thank you, but no thank you is a little bit formal. So you can say no thanks. And that's where we're talking about manners. So perhaps when the person says that your, your child has no training, they probably refer to the fact that the child does not express these courtesies, these, um, you know, manners and so on. All right. Um, Let's go a little further. I consider it courteous to call ahead to say that you're going to be late. And these days, people are very discourteous. I am waiting on you. Everybody has cell phones. Um, you, you call and say, you know, I'm running a bit late. You know, whether it's a hairdresser, uh, doesn't matter who you're going to. You know, we have an appointment, a doctor, and things happen. We have a lot of traffic on our roads, and sometimes you really set out in good time, and you are stuck somewhere uh, in traffic. I remember being stuck, uh, you can see the building, you know, it, it's, you know and uh, you, you can't move, it's gridlock, and you are driving. Now, if, if you were taking public transportation, it would have been easy to get out of the, the, the vehicle and walk. But here you are driving, you have no uh, a choice but to sit there looking at the building. And I had to call ahead and say, listen, I am right near the building. I can't move. The traffic is not moving. And I consider that as courtesy. Um, I, when you arrive late, courtesy also means that you should apologize for coming late. So when a child comes to class late, you have to say, miss, I'm sorry for being late, you know? And if the parent has time, the better thing would be to you accompany the child and you apologize to the teacher for being late, which is more acceptable. And what is going to happen is that the child is seeing you showing courtesy. We talked a little bit about the thank yous and no thanks or no thank you, excuse me, and that's so nice of you. Somebody does something good, nice for you. They hold a door, perhaps, and you can say, that's so nice of you. Say something pleasant. And those are the kind of courtesies that we want to see coming back. You know, pleasantries that make people happy. They, we, there's a, we live in a very stressful society. And uh, those things could lighten the, the, the load. But we primarily, we're talking about children because that's where it starts. You know, they say manners starts at home, begins at home. That's where we have to teach them. Um, so we were talking about courtesies, calling ahead when you're running late and so on. Um, if you have an opportunity, like you're going through the door and two of you reach together, it would be nice for you to step back and allow the other person to go because sometimes it's a small space, two persons can't fit. And I mean, both people are rushing to try to fit in this space. It's like people driving on the road and two cars can't fit and nobody wants to yield, as they say. Um, the courteous thing to me is to step back and allow the person to go. And it doesn't take that much you know, to do that for somebody. 
and uh, you know, or as is often done, take it and the person's right on your heels, you know, and if you close the door, you could almost hit that person <laughs> with the door. Take one minute and leave the door open for that individual and allow them to um, get to the door. Let's talk about virtues. And uh, um, my husband has a saying, because before I'll tell you why I'm saying virtues. He has a saying that um, values change, but virtues remain constant. And that's why you probably would expect me to talk about values, but I'm talking about virtues. And so those are some of the things that we should input into our children when you're talking about training up a child. And uh, those virtues are things like honesty, truthfulness, fair play, how to share, because small children um, are very territorial, they say, and they don't learn how to share. So you, we have to teach them how and insist that they share. Because usually, the little child doesn't want to share his toys, but when he goes somewhere else, he wants to take other people's things, you know? So you must show that child, all right, it's nice for that other person to share, but you must also share. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I like to smile because some little children, after they have been taught, will say, Jesus said to share. Yeah, but not when they want something. They remember Jesus said to share, but, <laughs> but not when they have to give something all, you know, over. And so, but all of those things, we have to train them along the way. So when we talk about training, all those things uh, are very important. Um, the mealtime as well um, is something that we need to train the child. Um, I remember our, our three children when they were toddlers, three years old, went to Montessori school. And that was part of the Montessori training. So it, it complemented what you did at home. They had to bring their um, cutlery, their plates, their um, whatever, cups and glasses and so on. So of course, you know, you had these nice sets of things and they're pretty and the children bring them and they had to set the table that each child had to have a table mat. And you had to have a, a little broom and, sho and shovel type thing. And uh, you saw that that child was uh, responsible for their space. So you had to sweep around your area, pick up whatever it is. And you, you, they had to wipe the, the, the table mat and so on. So I'm just saying to you, if you're talking about training, those are some of the things that we should train children. We just presume that the child will just get it. They're not going to get it because we didn't get it either. <laughs> um, somebody had to literally train us. The Bible says something very interesting to us. And it says, let me look, I'll find the script here. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. So even the script here tells us that training is absolutely important. I know uh, somebody coming from church, when you talk about training, usually what we have in mind is train, we're talking about training is the biblical things, you know, because um, we see some children, um, after a while, starting to shift away from what they were taught at home. But the Bible says it gives us that confidence that if you put that inside the child, at some point, what is inside of that child will bring them back in line. It's very important to do that kind of a training. Um, so we talked about all the things that you should practice. Now, it would not be overnight. and uh, as the children will slip up because we as adults, we slip up at times and so on. But as you do the training, you will see changes in your child's life. Um, so what are we to train them in? The things of God, um, the biblical philosophy of life. So from young, very young, as young as the child could understand, you begin giving them a philosophy of life from the scripture, from the Bible. What and does the Bible say on these things? And that's what we mean by philosophy of life. Another time, perhaps, I would do that. It's a very interesting study. My husband has a very interesting study on um, developing a philosophy of life. And at one point, I promise you, I'll do something. I'll do that. But from small, the child has to have a philosophy uh, on many things. For example, uh, you teach the child, if I found something, it does, it does not belong to me, then you give it to somebody. That's, uh, from very small, the child begins to have a philosophy, this is not mine, I can't keep it. And every time you make the child carry back something that they bring, um, uh, you reinforce that behavior all of the time. Sometimes the child will bring something home and they will say, well, a friend gave it to you. You make sure that that is so. 
right? My daughter, uh, she was in high school, she was in secondary school already, and I remember it was her birthday and she came home with this really lovely pair of gold earrings, and it looked very expensive to me, and she said that a friend uh, you know, gave her, but she had many other little gifts because they would exchange gifts. Now you would think that a, a small, a child, a teenager, don't have the kind of money to buy that. You know, they would give you a little stopper or something like that. And I actually called the parent. I said, you know, I, I need the number to find out if at all the parents knew that their daughter gave my child such an expensive piece of jewelry. And the mother said, yes, we are jewelers. And I allowed her to choose a piece to give to her friend. And I was satisfied. Because I'm doing that now because I want to reinforce the philosophy that we taught them at home. And I know it is absolutely impossible to really talk about child rearing in 30 minutes. <laughs> um, that whole process takes many years of trial and error. And because we have no parent in school, perhaps we should have parent in schools. That's a good idea to help some parents along um, because uh, we have moved from the culture of the extended family where we had the older ones in the same yard space or with us and so they coached us along in terms of um, bringing up our children. Now um, everybody is in their own little space and uh, we go back to trial and error again and sometimes the children are growing while we're trying <laughs> and uh, they're not waiting for us to sometimes correct some of the errors that we've done. Um, so today we're looking at what does it mean to train when the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not depart from it. And I said that makes me feel good to know that when you give the child the foundation that you is needed, even if that child um, slips away, deviates a bit, the Bible uh, makes us believe that the child will come back in line at some point or the other, so that's great. So what does the Bible mean when it talks about training? And I like to think it means in a very holistic way, you know, the whole man, the, the, a human being is made up of body, soul and spirit, or spirit, soul and body, as the Bible puts it. And so if you're talking training, it has to do in all the realms, in all the areas of that child's life. It's not just in one particular area. I know um, because we're church-based, you tend to think Bible only, but I believe um, God, the, God is referring to the whole person, the whole child. You're talking about the physical part of the child, the spiritual part of the child, and the, the soulish realm in that child, the intellect, the emotional realm because you have to teach that child um, anger, control from small, um, the tantrums and how to, you know, we have to tr deal with that. And uh, I, I said previously, the things that we consider cute when they're very small, uh, they <laughs> are no longer cute when they get a little older and we tolerate it, you know, we don't take the time to deal and treat with some of those things and then that child uh, grows up thinking that those behaviors are acceptable. So we have to deal with it. Um, so we talked about the philosophy of life. We talked about what behaviors are acceptable, you know, as a small child in your home. No, sometimes because your child is not isolated, uh, you may train them in a particular way, or you may teach them certain things, but they go out there. And then they will bring in from out there certain kinds of behaviors that uh, uh, is not what they learn at home. And I remember uh, I was very disappointed one day when my second son, if he sees it, you know, don't get vexed with me. One of them, the children came and said to me that he cursed. And um, they said, mommy, we can't tell you what he said. So if they couldn't tell you what he said, it couldn't be a good word. And uh, I was heartbroken. You know, I probably, I'm extreme. Why, you know, I was heartbroken and I called them. Usually, uh, you know, I'll be upset and I'll be angry. Somehow, it wasn't how I felt. I was crushed, I was disappointed. I felt that something was wrong with my training because we were very, very particular about like words and what they say and so on. 
And so I took him by, by himself and I started to talk to him. And I was crying. I said, but you didn't learn that from us. There's nobody in our family you ever he heard using any obscene words and things. And he started to cry and he said, mommy, you know, he heard his friends using it and he was so sorry. And that was the end of that. You know, um, so that uh, you have to now determine what is acceptable behavior for your child. For me, that was a big thing. Uh, for me, like this honesty is huge. And uh, you may do something and I will want to beat you, but you're dishonest and I will start to cry. Because as far as I'm concerned, this is big. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so if from that little age, um, you, you have to decide what is acceptable behavior for you. Because some people, the child cursing and you know, using obscenities and you find the cute because they're two. And sometimes they have a little lisp when they curse and everybody's laughing at the child. Come on, it's not funny. Those behaviors are not acceptable except if you, that is how you want to uh, live because there are some people who literally, well, don't know how to speak without using obscenities and I don't know how that person will survive because you're supposed to, everywhere you go, you know, you can't just talk <laughs> without saying something like that, uh, right? Um, for example, I also, if you're talking training, you need to teach a child a priority. So there's a time for everything. And each thing has its time and place. For example, a time for work, whether it's school work or whatever work that you have to do, a time for TV and a time for play. You know, when you should be doing your school work, you can't be doing, watching TV, you know? And when it's time to play, we really don't want the child to always be stuck in a book because there are some children who incline like that and, uh, you know, they don't want to go outside at all. They don't want fresh air. They don't want to play, and play is absolutely important for the child. And we say, no, she doesn't like to go, let her read the book, no. You want that child to, to be well balanced. So you have to kind of go there and do, uh, play a little game with the child that the child will enjoy. So the child will enjoy the outdoors with a little ball or they have a bike. And uh, I, I tell people, one of the things I regret is I'm the only person who, who can't ride in my family because, <laughs> and I, I, we lose that because it would be so nice when everybody has ride and uh, we would be going somewhere and you know, why not me? And I had a, a, the opportunity to learn to ride when I was young. My grandfather had a bike, but listen to me, he would uh, lean that bike on the step and I would sit with the bike leaning on the step and pedal, but my hand holding onto the step. <laughs> I was deathly afraid of falling. So I never learned to ride and I now regret it because that'd be fun. Take the children out, daddy's riding. And you know, I remember we went to Belgium and uh, it was like culture shock. Everybody was riding. So you had people like 80, they ride. Women ride. There were bikes all over the place. As a matter of fact, the train stations, they had the bikes and you, they have an arrangement where you rent a bike and you just put it in the train station, jump on the train and then take another bike on the next stop and you go home, bring it back in the morning and that kind of a thing. And so I'm saying to us, bring balance to the child. There's a time for every single thing and don't make the child feel that work is all that important and play is not. Play is absolutely important as well. Um, so we talk about uh, value system and uh, I decided not to use the word value remember I said so because values change we uh, those of us who are not that young in Trinidad and Tobago we realized that what we considered as values when we were younger they all change now yes everything seems to be topsy-turvy and so we prefer in the uh, in church to talk about virtues because virtues are constants for example um, we have a we live in a society where you have people saying that um, integrity and morality not important, actually coming out in public and saying so. Well, we believe that vir uh, integrity is a virtue and morality is a virtue, and we believe that those things are constants. So now I must train my child. As I come to a little close here, a coach trains an athlete, and he does two things. He works to improve the good in the athlete, and then he, he works at eliminating the bad or the undesirable practices in that athlete. So uh, simply put, uh, if we talk in training, there are two things that we have to do as parents if you're talking about training up a child. I must work at improving the good. Every child is gifted and skilled in some particular way. And all the good things that, that we want to see in our children, we have to now work 
to improve those good areas. You want them to have good manners, and so you want to reinforce, and you want to compliment, and you want to reward our children every time that those children exhibit these good qualities that you want. And then we have to work at eliminating the undesirable practices. So the quote says, you, you are a runner, but the child, the athlete runs and his arms are going all over the place. And what does the coach do? The coach will make him run again, keep the arms close to you. I don't want any wind to come between you and the arm, your arm. It will slow you down. And he has that child moving the arm in a particular way. How many times you have to do it? I don't know, as many times as he, he would perfect it. And that's the same thing we have to do at home in training. Some parents, as a teacher, they would come to me and say, oh, go miss, I'm so fed up. You can't be fed up. You know, I try to get them to do it again. How many times you tried? I don't know. A hundred? Well, make it a hundred and one. It's your child. <laughs> you know, you, you, when, when the football coach makes him kick a million times, and you stand up by the sidewalk and you want him to kick it. And when the child comes and says, he doesn't want to do it again, you send him back on the field. If coach say to kick it, go and kick it. Well, it's the same way when you're talking about morals and values and etiquette and all those good things that you're talking about. Do it again and again and again. All right? Um, I believe in our society that there's a need for another look at the training aspect of, of parenting. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I think pa a lot of parents think it's just to provide things for children. And especially if you came from a background where you didn't have all the stuff that you would have liked to have, and you give them all the things that you think that they should have, and we think we applaud ourselves and say, I'm a good parent. But there are many other aspects of parenting than just giving them things. Um, so I believe that's an area where we need to work at. This person who asked the question, when the person says that your child had no training, I want you to sit down and consider what that person has said. Um, maybe it was nice the way the person put it to you, but sit down and consider what that person said, consider what I have said, and see <laughs> what kind of work you have to put in there. And uh, it would be nice if one day the table turn and somebody else says to you, this child is so well trained, congratulations, you're a good parent. And that's what we're looking for, where anywhere we go, people can see that our children are very different. The book of the week is The Mysterious Kingdom of Heaven by Donnell Duncan. Donnell is our eldest son, and he talks about how God's system differs from all others. I'm just going to briefly look at the table of contents to give you a sense of uh, some of the things that Donnell discussed uh, in this book. Culture, religion, and the kingdom of God. Very important because our culture affects, again, our philosophy of life many times. And um, we have to understand where culture must stop when it comes to the kingdom of God. How far are we going to take the culture? Because some people say, well, I should practice this because it's our culture. Well, the kingdom of God is something that you have to take into consideration in terms of when we, what is acceptable in the culture. Um, the mystery of the seed, biblical laws of investment, the mystery of the kingdom, the need for honor, he comes back to where we need to honor each other, honor you know, people and you know, older folks, honor those in um, authority and so on. The faith for miracles. And this was a very interesting chapter because he talks about how people in Africa and some of those places get miracles because they don't have the medication. But we don't believe God because we could quickly go to the doctor. Um, the mystery of the Trinity and the sevenfold spirit of God. You need to get this book. Um, he, only when Donnell shared concerning the Trinity in this book, I had a sense of the Trinity. It was something that always puzzled me. And so it's a good book, The Mysterious Kingdom of Heaven, How God's System Differs from All Others by Donnell Duncan. We will be at the Magdalena Grand Lowlands Tobago at the Colibri Conference Room. Our conference runs from Wednesday the 8th of July to Sunday the 12th. Our Wednesday to Friday, that is the 8th to the 10th, our sessions begin at 7 p.m. On Friday and Saturday, we have leadership for a beginning at 10 a.m. and ending at 1 p.m. Sunday the 12th, our worship service begins at 9 a.m. and we have the close-off session at 6 p.m. on Sunday. Our theme, Awakening the Champion in You. I really hope that I helped you in some way or the other. Um, whether you had children or not, 
what we talked about could still be useful to you. Um, and sometimes we ourselves have to um, examine ourselves to see if we really have manners <laughs> and if we um, have training and if we will do our parents proud in the way that we carry our, about ourselves. But it's absolutely necessary for us to take the time, the effort, and it takes time, it takes effort to train our children properly. My name is Gemma Duncan. You've just been viewing Ask Pastor Gemma. I just want you to know that with God, everything is possible. God bless you.